three years ago, uh, in March 2011, I was traveling in India for a month, taking pictures for a, a few travel articles. And I've been on a train for 12 hours during the night. And I mean, we, we, we're kind of uh, having saying bad things about scorn of the vision here in Malmö. The trains in, in India is a completely different matter. It's not about if the trains are overbooked or, or late. It's more like if you can get the lady to move her box of chickens from your seat. So I've been traveling for 12 hours and I was pretty tired. My goal was Dharamsala, uh, a small city where uh, Dalai Lama lives with a few other uh, Tibetan refugees. And the last uh, few hours on this trip I had to rent a car because the train won't take me all the way. So I was going in this white minivan. Uh, it's basically a shoebox on, on, on wheels and kind of the same safety regulations as a shoebox too. And the driver, he took the, the white line in the middle of the road, kind of like a subtle suggestion. Uh, he was kind of all over the place. And I was lying down most of the time in the back seat because I was tired and I thought if we were going to crash, hopefully the front seat would stop me from flying out of the windshield. Uh, we were about 90 minutes into the trip where, you know the thing they, have, they talk about when you have this near-death experience, when everything slows down? and the world kind of goes in slow motion. That happened to me. Uh, I could hear the driver gasping for air, and just a few uh, moments after that, he was hitting the brakes. I flew into his seat, and then I heard this big bang, and everything stopped. And at this moment, I was really, really I didn't know where, where, where I was, where, what was up and down. After a while, I, I opened the door and sat down on the uh, seat of the car. Oh, no, sorry, the, the, the floor of the car, just to try to organize my mind. And when I looked forward, I could see this bright red uh, motorcycle, a Ferrari motorcycle lying on the the uh, pavement in front of the, the bus. This motorcycle was completely unharmed. It wasn't a scratch on it. When I took a look at my, my minivan, the car I've been traveling with, the front was completely smashed. I mean, there was uh, nothing left. The windshield was gone. The uh, front was pressed in. Uh, but the motorcycle was, was unharmed. And further in the front, there were the driver of my car and the driver of the motorcycle arguing with each other. Uh, first, it was pretty calm, they were talking, but more and more people joined in. And I'm not sure really from where, because we were in the middle of nowhere. There were a few huts and fields around us, but for some magical way, people were joining in from everywhere. There was some blood dripping. He was unharmed. And I look at his hand and I remembered I had a small first aid kit in my, uh, my camera bag. So I went back into the car, I got my bag and started to look, trying to find this, uh, this first aid kit. And uh, I, 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 said, I said to this, this crowd, I said, excuse me, and suddenly, from being like a, a, a mob of shouting people pushing each other around, everything went quiet. I, I signaled for, for the man with the uh, bruises to, to come over to me and, and sit down on the, on the car. And suddenly this man, that was completely capable of standing a second before, was led to me by two women, one in each hand, one in each arm, and they sat him down, 
on the uh, on the floor and he kind of backed away, just looking at me. Um, and I, I I didn't have a clue what to do. I mean, I had no medical education whatsoever, so I was kind of pouring everything out from this little bag on the on the roof of the car, trying to go through it, trying to find something to actually use on him. I put these blue blue plastic gloves on. I've seen that on TV, and I cleaned his wounds with the, uh, you know, the small, tiny, wet napkin you have on airplane, airplanes after you've had the food. And I put some kind of bandage around it. And uh, I mean, it was huge. It was, it looked like we amputated his arms. <laughs> That's the size of that bandage. And uh, I just tried to do something to prevent people from killing me. And I did survive. Uh, a few minutes ago, or a few minutes after that, uh, I was in another van, similar, ex or ex actually the exact same kind of van. This time I was traveling with six monks dressed in purple, uh, heading the same way as I was doing. And they arrived just a few minutes after I, I did my doctor. I have no clue what I'm doing routine and they were talking to the people involved and I asked them in the car I told them what happened I mean uh, 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 when I started to talk people were just looking at me like they've never seen someone like me before so I asked them uh, is it unusual for uh, foreigners to, to be in this area of, of the country and he looked at me this guy and he told me well it's been a lot of stories lately about foreign people making a lot of trouble in, in, in large cities around here, uh, robbing people. So they thought you were going to pull up a knife from your bag. So we were there, all, all of us, and we kind of made this, had these ideas of each other without knowing anything. So, and, and, and this, this phenomenon is pretty common. We're doing it all the time. Uh, I mean, since the time when humans were able to think for themselves and make conscious decisions, we, we've been uh, putting people and animals into categories because it's a way for us to decide if it's dangerous or not. I mean, big teeth, probably dangerous. Run. Uh, small and, and fluffy, uh, either pet it or, or eat it. So, and, and before it was, it was important for us to do that, but we still have that with us. And today, we're not faced with a lot of life-threatening situations anymore. Uh, Today we have the opportunity to know pretty much everything about anything through social media and internet. And we can also share whatever is happening in our life at any time. And for those countries where they don't have the possibility to, to share because lack of internet or such things, we are sending people to, to share their stories for them. We're sending photographers, we're sending uh, journalists. And uh, I mean, uh, photojournalism has been around since the birth of the camera. It's like the oldest kind of photography there's ever been. And every day people are, are traveling to capture the reality of people that can't share their stories themselves. So we should have a pretty clear picture about what is happening in the world around us right now. Uh, the only problem is we usually believe that documentary photography is an objective kind of photography. But because it's made by people, it usually isn't. There's uh, three 
are problems with documentary photography. First of all, uh, culture. I mean, me as a Swedish person, being born and raised in Sweden, with uh, with maypoles and uh, meatballs and and stuff like that. If I would go to let's say Kenya, and I would walk around in the cities and I would experience things, uh, I would in interpret whatever is happening around me in a different way than someone from Kenya would do. So it could be a problem that I am trying to tell the stories uh, of a totally an another culture. Another problem is uh, the money issue because Today it's a kind of a struggle between newspapers and other media outlets to, to get the, the viewers, to get the readers, because people aren't very happy to pay for things anymore. We can find everything on, on the internet. So if a newspaper uh, wants to be able to sell uh, single copies, they need to find some really juicy stories. Uh, and Unfortunately, uh, the best stories, the stories that sell, is the ones about war and destruction and uh, murder. <coughs> the third reason why documentary photography isn't very objective is that whenever a photographer is sent to, to a company or a, a country or a place, the topic or the title of the article is usually already set. I mean, if someone is sent to cover the destruction of an earthquake, earthquake, that's what the photographer will be looking for. And it might even be that the destruction isn't that big, but the photographer has got his assignment and he needs to find the pictures to go with that. There's a picture uh, a few years ago from the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, it won the uh, Picture of the Year Award here in Sweden. There's uh, a Haitian girl, 15 years old, laying on the, on the pavement dressed in a pink dress. She's been, been shot by the police. They were trying to stop uh, looters. And she's lying down with uh, a couple of paintings in her arms. And behind her, you can see the, the massive destruction of the road. It's just broken up and it's just piles everywhere. And it's a really, it's a really powerful picture. It's, it's almost beautiful in, in some sense. <coughs> uh, and then there's another picture taken at the exact same moment, but from a different angle. Still shows the, the young girl, but it also shows the 15 photographers crammed into a few square meters, all trying to get that perfect picture. So it's easy to try to actually create the pictures that you want to have before you leave home. And, and whenever we're talking about uh, war and, and destruction or, or death, usually there's one of the countries involved that we call developing countries. And uh, do, you know, do you know what countries is in that category? Uh, I, I didn't know. Uh, actually, the question struck me when I was on a plane from, from Bali this January. Uh, and when we landed, I looked it up on, on Google. Uh, and the developing countries, as we call it, because it's, it's, it's us that named them developing countries. It's basically everything but North America, Europe, and Australia. And that's, that's a lot of countries. That's a big chunk of the world. Uh, and, the, and being a developing country is usually decided from how much money you make. That's, kind of the only, the only uh, thing that decides if you're going to be a developing country or not. And I have this idea that maybe we should 
try to find a way to uh, walk away from our preconceptions to to give people uh, a chance to give us the true picture because when I say developing country what image do you see in front of you I mean if you're like me and if you're like many other people you usually get the picture of uh, a small tiny thin kid with no food lying in the dirt or maybe a, a huge family living in a small <coughs> small hut or a small shelter in the middle of nowhere it sounds it might sound like a really uh, small thing but have you ever experienced a customs officer actually smiling at you and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the like the forced uh, fake smile <laughs> I'm talking about a real smile he was happy to see me and and you kind of learn how to recognize a real smile as a photographer uh, when you when have a fake smile, everything uh, the only thing that is happening is your mouth is moving. When you're smiling for real, all of your face is 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 moving. The muscles in your face uh, is being used. And he was doing that. And this kind of smile met me everywhere I went during a month in Bali. And these people are living happy lives. They're helping each other. They're not poor. They have amazing food, and uh, Bali is a part of Indonesia that is, by us, named a uh, developing country. So maybe we should try to broaden our way of uh, putting uh, countries and people into uh, sections and, and categories. I went to Cuba in 2012. Cuba is one of the countries that we don't hear a lot about from the actual inhabitants because it's very close you can't use internet uh, I've never been invited to so many homes uh, I've never been invited to share so many drinks uh, and, and a tip if you go uh, stop at one drink because a mojito in Cuba is kind of rum and not too much more uh, but these people, they don't have anything, but they give you everything. And they are extremely intelligent. They have an excellent educational system. They're actually exporting uh, doctors all around the world. Uh, but they, uh, Cuba is a developing country. Uh, so I think it's time that we start to measuring wealth in another uh, currency than money. <clears throat> and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that everything is good, that uh, all people on earth is living happy lives. There is still people needing help, there's still people uh, that need aid. But what I'm saying is, there is progress. Uh, if you compare the world today with the world 20 years ago, you will see that a lot of countries, almost every country in the world, is richer now than 20 years ago. And they're making a lot of progress. They're getting better. But because we, the Western countries, the rich countries, are telling the stories for them, the stories will always be about war and, and, and destruction and murder. Because that's what will sell newspapers in Sweden. So, I have this idea uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm working with, with a few friends of mine, that hopefully will help us uh, take a step in the right direction. Because I believe that everyone in the world has the right to tell their own story by themselves. So, this project we're working on is not an app, it's not a cool new gadget, it's uh, a non-profit organization that we call I Am. It's a long way to get there. 
you know, what are you talking about? Uh, and it's not a new idea, it's been done similar things before. What we're going to do is we're working together with uh, a few places around the world. We've got a children's uh, orphanage in Ukraine. We have a girls school in Kenya and a child center in Ethiopia. And all of these uh, nodes, they have a group of kids living there. So we're going to go there for two weeks doing a photo workshop with them. We will be bringing cameras, we will be bringing computers, everything you need to take photos. And during the first week we will uh, teach them how to use a camera. We won't be teaching them how to take photos because it's kids. It's kids between 12 and 21 and they know how to take a photo. If I would go there and I would teach them how I photograph, they will start to see the world in the way I'm seeing the world. And we don't want that. We want to teach them just as much as they need to be able to take a picture. And then we want them to photograph their world from their perspective. Uh, during the second week, they will all make a project of their own showing progress in their area, in their community. It could be anything from a new well being built, it could be an epicenter being built, or they could follow their mother in her new business as a, as a, in a bakery. It could be the, the friends of them, what they have invented. Anything that would be showing progress in their life and during all of this these days these two weeks we will be sharing everything that, that they are doing through our website our platform and of course through social media Facebook and what we do here in Sweden and the interesting thing is that people like you and me we will be able to uh, com communicate with the kids when they are actually taking the pictures through comments and video video uh, greetings and the kids will be able to uh, answer you so we will actually have a conversation kind of real time uh, when we are doing the workshop we will be working together with uh, a few local photographers, local artists, and uh, first of all to, to kind of cross the cultural uh, obstacle that we have between us. They can help us to interpret certain things, but mostly because when we go back home after two weeks, we're leaving a few of the cameras, a few of the computers behind, so that these local photographers, local artists can continue to teach more kids how to take pictures and they can let the kids that really enjoyed what we were doing the first two weeks continue with that. And we will be able to follow the progress that is happening in that community even <coughs> after we've gone home. The, uh, the book company that I'm involved in will be uh, creating our coffee table book with the pictures from the three first uh, uh, workshops and the profits from that book and the profits from when we're selling the pictures on our website will go right back to I am to fund the, uh, the next workshops and hopefully this will be an ongoing non-profit organization <coughs> and at this moment, we haven't actually been anywhere. We're still working on getting the funds to, to buy the cameras and to buy the uh, computers. And we're working on building our, our website. But uh, I believe when we, when we go, we will not solve the, all the problems in the world, but we will most certainly take 
a step towards solving it. We will help people understand more about each other. We will give the a few kids the possibility to tell the story about their lives, to show the progress in their community. Uh, they'll be able to show us what they think is important in their country. And in 20 years, the kids that are 12, 15 years old today will be the ones that are running every country. <coughs> Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.